Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business app. We are joined on the program by Mark Heppenstahl, president and CIO of Penn Mutual Asset Management. Mark, thanks very much for being with us uh, over the weekend, as it were. Well, as we heard there from Doug earlier, it's a really big week for earnings this week with uh, a lot of the uh, biggest tech companies reporting. We've got three key central banks and then a big jobs report coming up on Friday. Uh, In terms of the earnings, first companies were rewarded for their AI spending, and then when Apple or when Alphabet reported they were castigated. Uh, So what's it going to be this week? Well, that is a very good question. Um, You know, I will say the bar has been set very, very high. And I think, um, you know, as you mentioned, the performance of Tesla and Alphabet after earnings last week um, was an indication that in some cases, maybe the bar has just been set a little bit too, too high. But You know, it does seem as though, you know, the question on how some of these companies are basically going to monetize the technology around AI has yet to be decided. And, you know, clearly NVIDIA is the one that I would say is most important in terms of, um, you know, just sort of its impact so far this year. So, you know, my guess is that, um, you know, you may see a similar reaction this week um, after earnings or release, um, because I I just don't really think there's going to be a huge upside yet from these companies uh, with with AI. So how are you feeling generally about the thesis that this is a transformative technology? uh, There's no turning back from it. And we really don't fully understand what it's capable of doing. But that's not to say that it won't have significant lasting impact. How are you on the thesis? No, I do. I do think that, um, you know, all of the technology people I speak with, um, you know, are, are amazed at how transformative AI is and has the potential to be. So, you know, I do think that the impact um, is going to be significant. Um, but I, I do think it is, you know, somewhat of a long-term proposition. So I think, again, trying to gauge some of the short-term earnings impacts on um, certain companies resulting from AI is it's probably a little bit too early for that. But again, I, I do think that the impact is going to be um, meaningful in the U.S. economy. So we've had this churn in the marketplace, and, and we've had the gap shrink uh, quite significantly between the equal weight and the cap-weighted S&P. Uh, I guess it's a good thing to many people out there, uh, but will it continue? Well, I will say, you know, I think we've been waiting for some type of a broadening out, um, just just given the heavy, heavy um, nature of the performance impact um, of the MAG-7 on the S&P 500 and some other indices as well. So, you know, I, I do think that um, it's likely to keep broadening out here for a while. And again, as I mentioned, I think if there is somewhat of a, a muted response to um, earnings this week from the MAG-7, I, I think that that's less likely to be the story. And I would say, you know, I do think that if the, the S&P and other indices are going to march to, to record highs, I, I think it's going to take um, a lot of other companies help helping with the lift there now. So we have a Fed meeting. A conventional wisdom here is that they're going to set the stage, they being uh, Fed policy members, for a rate cut in September, maybe 25 basis points. How are you feeling about uh, easier monetary policy providing a nice push for the equity market from now till the end of the year? Is 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 that how you see it playing out? Is there some downside risk that, that we're not talking about? Well, it, it has been very interesting to see how much, you know, the front end of the yield curve has reacted. We've seen a significant steepening of, of the yield curve um, really for the past month and month, month and a half or so. So, you know, it does seem as though, you know, the bond market has had um, sort of this inclination to try to front run the Fed with uh, with rate cuts. You know, so far when they front front run the Fed, they've actually gone too far. So, um but but I do think um, you know the economy seems like it's still in okay shape. You know I, I do think the Friday jobs report is the one thing that um, you know there are some cracks seeming to form in the in the jobs market. So I think that's something to watch. But as long as yeah. the job market looks relatively 
relatively stable, you know, I think that the easier money is likely to be a boost for financial assets. Yeah, you get the SOM rule uh, just sort of pending or looming there. So a lot of people are scared that uh, if that's triggered, uh, uh, you know, that uh, there could be trouble ahead. So let, let's just generalize it more for the average person because, you know, most average people probably don't even know what the SOM rule is. Uh, but do you think at the moment – given all that you are seeing, that there's more danger for the Fed falling behind here? Or do you think there's more danger in declaring victory too soon on inflation? Well, I will say, if you'd asked me a couple of months ago, I would have said the danger was declaring victory too soon. But it does seem as though, um, you know, the fall in industrial commodity prices, the fall in oil prices recently, I think, is likely to keep inflation moderating for the near future. And again, given the SOM rule, and I will say, you know, it's amazing how the SOM rule has become front and center in terms of what economists and a lot of um, investors are talking about in terms of economic numbers. But, um, you know, I, I do think we're at a point now where, um, you know, the Fed is likely um, to cut in September unless there's a real shock to um, an inflation print uh, between now and the September meeting. And I do think that, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, that, Obviously, they're going to still emphasize the need to be data dependent at this week's meeting. But I, I do think that a Fed rate cut is likely barring some some surprise um, in the inflation prints. How are you feeling about geographic diversity when it comes to investing? Are there opportunities offshore right now that are compelling to you that may cause you to rebalance a little away from the U.S.? Well, I will say the um, you know the, the U.S. outperformance, U.S. exceptionalism, you know, is is part of the equation there, and just you know clearly the importance of the Mag Seven in terms of being a, such a big driver for U.S. equity market performance. Um, but you know, I, I do think ultimately diversification will still be the best form of risk management. So you know, I think that global diversification um, makes sense in light of you know, you know just valuations and where things are sitting um, currently. So, and again, we tend to we tend to focus a lot on the credit markets, and so um, again, we're we're finding a lot of great opportunities um, in the U.S. credit markets today, and being able to deploy capital at interest rates that a couple of years ago seemed almost impossible. So, um, yeah. it's uh, it's been a great opportunity set for us. Well, Doug mentioned that not only the Fed this week, but also the Bank of England and the BOJ. Uh, curious about the recent strength in the Japanese yen, how you see that moving here in the short term, and if there's anything in, in Japan that really interests you. Well, again, you know, we, we are focused primarily in the world of fixed income. And I will say, you know, in terms of interest rates, I would say nothing is uh, particularly exciting um, in, in the Japanese bond market at this point. But, you know, I do think that, you know, the unwind of the yen carry trade, and again, talk about something that's been longstanding in the markets and the yen carry trade has, you know, been sort of a source of, of profits for a very long time for a lot of uh, investors that use leverage. So, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, I would say likely that, you know, the, the yen has likely bottomed at this point. Mark, thank you for taking out the time to be with us. Mark Heppenstall, president and CIO of Penn Mutual Asset Management. We're fortunate to have with us in our studios right here in Hong Kong, Ekaterina Bigos, who's CIO, Core Investment, Asia X Japan, at AXA Investment Managers. Ekaterina, thank you very much for joining us. So it's a big week this week. I'll probably leave out something, but obviously we've got election maneuvering. We've got central banks, big tech earnings, and, and also the U.S. jobs report. Uh, what's most important? And feel free, if you must, to say all of the above. Yes, I mean, certainly not a quiet summer, uh, but I would say probably all of the above are important. And, and it depends, I guess, what are you looking at? Are you looking at movements in the markets? Are you looking at trajectory for monetary policy? Ah, yeah. But of course, uh, in terms of the monetary policy, and of course, we have the Fed meeting on Wednesday, uh, it's been well telegraphed and expectations are that September will be a move and this will be uh, for this meeting will be on pause, uh, but with a fairly well guided uh, decision. Uh, and in terms of earnings, of course, uh, that is uh, busy for this week uh, with uh, four of the companies reporting from Magnificent 7 uh, and has been very closely watched because uh, those are having impact on the performance of the tech sector, which has been one of the most well-performing uh, sectors year, year to date. So uh, certainly those are all important. Then we have 
POJ uh, and, and Bank of England, of course, which shouldn't be ignored in terms of the, the global market dynamics as well. What's your assessment of the global economy right now? In terms of global economy, certainly it's it's slowing down. But the point here to say that the resilience is persisting. Uh, and we'll talk about resilience if you look at the GDP numbers for U.S. Uh, we had uh, the Q2, which steadily says stronger than expected, beat at all expectations. And I think this is quite relevant uh, when it comes to the ability for the Fed to start normalizing monetary policy, uh, but not kind of tripping the, the U.S. economy into a slowdown or protracted slowdown. Uh, so certainly very reassuring in terms of uh, the growth numbers. And I think more broadly, uh, if you look at the uh, global economy, largely expectations that they will stay uh, subpar to uh, previous growth, uh, but stay more resilient. And again, you have to break it down by emerging markets and, and developed markets. Uh, but I think the strength in U.S. economy is certainly reassuring uh, to the, the broader uh, growth. So, so, so so all of a sudden, it feels pretty good again. I mean, you, you, if you think about it, softer inflation numbers, growth, it's hanging in there. You've had some of the froth that's been, you know, swept off the top of some of the big tech names. Uh, uh, but, you know, you're never too far away from fear in these markets. How do you feel at the moment if you're long equity? Yeah, and I think <clears throat> one point to say that with regards to the strength in the U.S. economy, certainly it's been a surprise uh, to the forecast that we had, particularly in 2023, when everybody was calling for a recession. 2024 has been uh, repriced, and many have expected that the U.S. economy stay more resilient. That has uh, certainly provided uh, support uh, to the broader market uh, resilience. But more importantly, uh, if you look at the performance of the tech sector, that's been supported by uh, the, IR, the, the CHIP Act that is put in the U.S. So fiscal stimulus has been been one of the catalysts uh, for that support. And another one is certainly has been the fact that the AI excitement or the artificial intelligence excitement has helped the tech stock. So it's very concentrated rally. So when we talk about uh, what we feel about the current state of the markets, we shouldn't ignore that the current rally or year-to-date rally has been <clears throat> very concentrated in that tech names. Uh, and I think uh, for the last couple of weeks, I would say three weeks or so, markets have looked uh, at the broader markets. So me to small caps started to to uh, a rally. Again, market is looking at valuations, being attractive, uh, and also the expectations that uh, the U.S. growth will stay uh, more resilient. Again, the question, whatever it's premature or not uh, to be seen, uh, but certainly the market is attempting to uh, to put weight a little bit more in the broader market rather than just the uh, tech. So I hear your optimism about the global economy slowing, yes, but resilient. Let's not forget China and your expertise is obviously Asia x Japan. To what extent is a weak Chinese economy holding back the globe right now? Uh, it certainly it does, and I would say with uh, a larger degree to emerging markets, uh, and I, I, we know the dependencies of emerging markets to China, and I think the broader sentiment uh, for emerging markets has been uh, closely correlated to uh, China performance, and certainly uh, the growth numbers that are coming from China, but more the broader macro data, uh, it's certainly weak. Uh, they're certainly in a deflationary uh, environment at the moment. Consumer confidence is weak. The investment uh, confidence is weak. Uh, the foreign investment has been weak. So broader uh, investment, if you may call appetite for investment, has been quite depressed. Uh, and then also, well, we've seen a resilience in, in, in China's economy. Uh, so, has been industrial production, uh, which has been supported by a directed uh, government stimulus. Uh, and again, it's one-sided, so unbalanced, quite an unbalanced, uh, resilience som somewhat in, in the Chinese economy, but weak resilience, if you might call it. So this massive strength we saw in the yen last week took a little pressure off the yuan, and I think the central bank in, in China was probably somewhat uh, comforted by that. But, you know, when we talk about unintended consequences, it seems that there was some last week, uh, or there were some, uh, with strength in the yen. I don't know how much you looked at that, but how much did that strength in the yen kind of destabilize markets elsewhere in the region? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say the, the strength in the end certainly is driven by uh, policy expectations. I would say somewhat uh, Bank of Japan expectations uh, for this week, uh, but more importantly, the expectations that uh, the Federal Reserve will start normalizing monetary policy in uh, September, uh, certainly some of that uh, reversal of the yen uh, has led uh, to some of the carry trades being unwind. Uh, and I would say for uh, broader Asia, I think that's a positive uh, in a way. Again, it removes some of the tension, some of the pressure. And certainly for uh, Bank of Japan, uh, it is uh, positive because it removes some of the pressure that they have in terms of where they are in the stance with regards to their own monetary policy. Uh, so broadly, I think the Fed moving in September, uh, it's a 
positive for uh, for Japan, but also for broader Asian economy, is a positive because it relieves some of that currency pressure. Mm. Certainly, we've seen the move uh, from Bank of China, uh, Bank of China, moving with their interest rate cuts, uh, and a part of it is uh, again not all of it, and we can talk about it in details if we need to. Uh, but uh, a part of it is driven by the fact that uh, the Fed is expected to cut in September. Certainly, gave them that a window uh, to accommodate on the end and to support the economy. You were talking a moment ago about the deflationary forces at work in China. Is there a real risk here that this is a, kind of a protracted exercise that China will not be able to rescue itself from this trap? Yeah, there's a, we do see a potential risk of that being entrenched, uh, that weak uh, demand being entrenched in the economy. Uh, and I think ultimately the, what the market is watching for, what are the cyclical, conscious cyclical measures uh, that China is, look to put, is looking to put in place uh, to revive the economy. Uh, if you look at all the developed market uh, theories and, and the actions that developed markets have done in situations like that, uh, it's um, to revive the economy, you either have aggressive fiscal stimulus or you have negative interest rates or supportive interest rates. Uh, and China has been quite balanced in both of those remits. Uh, and I think my expectations are that they will do more in the second part of the year to support the economy potentially to to, uh, to help that uh, transition out of that deflationary period. Yeah, I wanted to ask you more about the carry trade and people, um, you know, having to pay back in yen, so they're selling and all that. But I know Japan is not uh, your focus. So let me just ask you a more general question here. Given all we've talked about, uh, what do you what do you feel most compelled by here? What's the what's the single best trade out there right now for Ekaterina Bigos? Yeah, and I think in terms of where we're looking at for the second part of the year, I would say the resilience is still going to stay in parts of the market that we've seen uh, so far staying afloat for, 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 for from the beginning of the year. Uh, I would say with themes that are supported uh, by um, – uh, fiscal stimulus. Uh, I've talked about technology uh, and artificial intelligence. Of course, the market has corrected uh, to some degree on the back of expectations of results around the investment that's been put in artificial intelligence. Uh, but I would say technology theme uh, and the broader development, uh, the need to uh, technologically advance and manufacture chips, for instance, in the US, will put all deploy investment and focus in that technological sphere. Uh, so things like technology, robot technology, were quite constructive on. So I would say themes is what we're looking at. Uh, in terms of uh, the broader market uh, performance, there's scope for that to uh, rally into the second part of the year, but we need to have uh, the Fed well on its journey to normalize monetary policy uh, and certainly have a guidance of what they're going to do uh, into the year end and certainly into the second part of the year. So I would say more patience for the broader market. The themes that have stayed resilient will stay, uh, and I would say still stay quality, still stay in themes uh, for the remainder of the year. Last question, 30 seconds. I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have. Geopolitics now, the possibility of a Trump presidency and a lot more in the way of tariffs. What's in your view? view the fallout of something like that? I, I think it's very hard to predict at the moment what a potential fallout. I mean, the theories say that when you implement tariffs, uh, the implications for uh, the country that uh, or the country, the uh, the receiver of those tariffs is deflationary. Mm. So Asia or China will have deflation. Yep. The degree of that deflation is certainly to be decided yep. and potentially inflationary for the receiver, for the okay. country that is putting the tariffs on. Ekaterina, thank you for joining us. Ekaterina Biggo, CIO at AXA Investment Managers. Joining us now is the Governor Eric Holcomb. He is the Republican uh, Governor of Indiana, and he is in Singapore. He's also visiting Australia this week to explore some new economic opportunities. Governor, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Doug. Yeah, I'm curious as to how the economy in Indiana is performing and how that may correlate with the specific goals that you have during this trip. Well, we're experiencing an, really an unprecedented uh, amount of momentum, positive momentum. Uh, currently, right now, when you think about uh, a state like Indiana, a small state, relatively speaking, in America, uh, three years ago, we had a, a record high capital investment into our state. It was about $8.7 billion. Uh, two years ago, we were over $20 billion. Last year, we were at $28.7 billion. Uh, and over 20 billion of that 28.7 billion was foreign direct investment. And so for a state like Indiana, that's the number one manufacturing state per capita in the country, 
We have five auto OEMs, make over 80% of the RVs, make engines, transmissions. Um, Eli Lilly's headquartered in Indiana, Zimmer Biomet, uh, and on and on. So life sciences, also a powerful punch. Um, we have supply chains, tier ones, tier twos, tier threes, all over the world. And it requires us to show up. Uh, yeah. if we want to keep this momentum going forward. So so things sound pretty good. That's not exactly the narrative that we hear at the national level uh, from <laughs> Republicans. But we didn't want to talk politics so much in this. We really did want to focus on... Tra- I'm curious, at the governor level, uh, how much pressure are you feeling from business folks that you talk to to either increase or decrease business with China? Now, what we're hearing are folks that wake up every day that are trying to grow their in enterprises, uh, their businesses that want certainty and predictability and stability and continuity. And for a state like Indiana, that's what, that's what we offer. That's our, that's our, in our DNA, so to speak. And, and so for, when you look at, you know, all these geopolitical tensions around the world, be it China, our number one fierce competitor on the global stage, obviously, Thinking about Russia and NATO, thinking about Israel that I heard you all just tee up, uh, uh, thinking about cyber attacks, thinking about um, uh, folks who are wanting to de-globalize. Um, we hear from folks that want to de-risk, that want to make sure that their supply chains are hmm. just in case as much as just in time. And so that's where states like Indiana, everywhere I go, I always ask who I meet with, uh, how many governors have been here this year? And just because it's so competitive for states to take the lead, obviously, uh, our federal government, Department of State, Department of Defense, et cetera, um, have the uh, responsibility and authority to be making sure there's free and fair trade enforced um, around the world. But it's up to states to take the lead to grow the economies on their main streets uh, yeah. all throughout the country. And so that's why we're so yeah. hyperactive. So do you think that you've had a, a reliable, a good partner in the federal government here as as you more move forward to try to meet these goals? Well, I think they've almost um, have an impossible job when they when you wake up every single day and have to be everywhere in the world. I'm reminded that we're not unique uh, you just mentioned Venezuela. You mentioned Israel. Um, everywhere that we have gone, um, there seems to be concern about how to grow. Not only not only with the geopolitical tensions, but also with workforce development. So many other issues that go alongside with it. But we seek to partner with the federal government, no matter the administration, on on interests that will benefit the state of Indiana. I tend to focus on my home state and 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 not others unless it's to see how close they are nipping at my heels governor you're nine days in on this trip uh, so you've you've gotten an yeah. earful i'm sure uh, from people that yeah. you've sat down with I, i'm curious what you're hearing from australia and 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 countries in asian yeah. about you know yeah. how they don't want to get caught up uh got caught between the u.s yeah. and china yeah what what i'm hearing is and it's it's um crystal clear is that they they have some of the brightest minds on planet earth um and a very entrepreneurial spirit and um uh financing to go along with it what they need are places to scale up and when you look at uh, the consumer base uh the clientele that america offers there's nowhere else on earth that compares and so for that's where, again, I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm looking at what's Indiana's role? What's my what's our state's cut in all this bring them home. potential growth? <laughs> yeah, bring it bring it home back home in Indiana again. And so uh, it's an exciting time to be out there and you have to be able to deal with all the distractions and you can fill in the blank with uh, an election, uh, an invasion. Uh, and th- there are more, obviously, than just distractions. Uh, but you have to deal with those issues of the day from a federal perspective. But we states uh, can't afford to take a day off 
just because of a new or different issue that we haven't faced before have you as had, a nation. I'm sorry to interrupt there. I'm curious as to whether you've had a conversation or an experience on this trip that may have created or sparked a new way of thinking about solving a problem. Uh, talk about the creativity of, of this trip. I mean, anything new? Yeah, sure. Uh, wh- what has really struck me on this trip, and this is my uh, 24th trip, international trip since I've been governor. Uh, but wow. what's really struck me uh, is is the number of projects that we are working on, maybe at Purdue University or Notre Dame or Indiana, Rose Holman, back home, one of our companies, uh, a challenge that we're addressing, that they are as well. We were in um, Swinburne University uh, in Melbourne a couple few days ago. And they were working on what happens when two black holes collide and how do you harness the energy out in the universe when that occurs? Wow. They were also working on how you charge uh, an electric semi truck uh, as it's driving down the interstate. Well, we're working on those things back in Indiana as well. Hmm. And uh, now how we can or, or, you know, we we visited. um uh, Trelix, uh, who's who's partnering with Eli Lilly. Governor, we'll leave it there. Governor Eric Holcomb from the state of Indiana joining us here. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.